Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Men and women, male and female. Before we get into the word today, let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, together with the songwriter, we declare today that we need thee. Oh, how we need thee. Every hour, we need thee. We need thee more than healthy bodies. We need thee more than bulging bank accounts. We need thee even more than the embrace of the most precious human being. We need thee more than we need our sports team to win. We need thee more than the victory of our favorite politician. We need your restoration for our discouragement. We need your forgiveness for our sin. We need your healing touch for our diseases. We need your power in our weaknesses. We praise you today for the joy of worship, for the joy of fellowship, for the joy of singing, for the joy of praying, and now for the joy of looking into your precious and unchanging word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Quite often, people talk about the sermon after it's preached. But today, everybody's been talking about this sermon before it's been preached. I imagine uh, simply because of the title. Let's look at our text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and then three other verses which have much to say about the same subject. 1 Corinthians 11 beginning with verse 3. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, Woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Then over to chapter 14, beginning with verse 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. 
They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Then over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Then let's see what Peter has to say in 1 Peter chapter 3. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. And, it, and it as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You may have heard about the guy who tried to swim across the English Channel. He got two-thirds of the way across, got very tired, and so he decided to swim back from where he came. <laughs> I kind of feel like that swimmer today. Uh, you know, I determined to preach through 1 Corinthians, but sometimes when coming to a certain chapter, you just want to turn it back and not deal with it. But I knew that eventually uh, we'd have to deal with these passages. And uh, after reading the text and other passages that deal with the same issue, we realize that we've got somewhat of a problem here. Can a woman pray and prophesy, or is she to remain silent? Can women serve in leadership roles, or must they simply stay in the kitchen or the nursery or young children in Sunday school classes? Today, I'd like to put women in their place. Now the difficulty is, what is their place? I realize that we're going to be swimming in shark infested waters today, and that uh, no matter what I say or include, conclude, some of you won't be happy with me, and that's okay. Because that's kind of the way it's been concerning this subject since the first centuries of the church. So, let's dive into these passages, which seem to be confusing and 
even contradictory and see if we can discover some consistency and pattern that not only fit the first century, but the century in which we live today. We're going to deal with three realities. God's principles for all times and all places. Paul's precautions for a specific time and place. And then finally, our privileges for this time and place. So first of all, what are God's principles concerning the place of men and women in the church that are true for all times and all places? There are a number of them. Number one, both men and women are created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. So there is equality in value and the capacity to relate to God. It says also here that they are heirs together with men of the gracious gift of life. So that's the overarching principle. Secondly, man is the head of the woman. Now this word is translated head in the English can have two meanings. It can mean either source or ruler. And as I read scripture, I contend that originally it meant source or out of. For instance, Genesis 2.23, Adam says when looking at the woman, he said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The word woman means out of man. So the primary meaning of the word head is source, not ruler. However, there is clearly a sense in which God calls man to have authority over woman because of the fall. Genesis 3.16, speaking to the woman, God says, your desire will be for your husband or you shall be subject to your husband, and he will rule over you. So, it seems that man as head, in the sense of ruler or authority, comes because of sin. It, it looks like it is part of the curse and not part of God's original plan. Third principle, in Christ, man and woman are interdependent. In verses 11 and 12, it says, In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. Whereas woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. So, Woman is from man, but also man is born of a woman. So God's original plan in creation is fulfilled and restored through Christ and his redemptive work. Another principle, both must bring glory to God by maintaining order rather than chaos. Uh, one overarching principle that I always come back to is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, where before he talks about the fact that the woman must submit to the man and the man and the husband must love his wife like Christ loved the church, he says this, submit to one another out of reverence <coughs> for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So 
there is submission on both sides. It's different for the woman than it is for the man. But there is to be submission to one another because of our reverence for Christ. So those are some of God's principles that are true for all time and for every place. Now let's deal with Paul's precautions for the specific time and the specific place that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians and Timothy and then as Peter talks about it also. Three words. Quietness, submission, and silence. Quietness, submission, and silence. That was Paul's precaution for that specific time and that specific place. So, <clears throat> why was that? Why did he give these precautions? Well, here's the situation. The believers in Corinth have discovered that Christianity is not just for men, but it is also for women. God calls both men and women to salvation. And this is the first taste of spiritual freedom. And for the women, it is sweet and exhilarating. But remember that this church is very carnal and immature. And the women apparently have begun to express their legitimate feelings of freedom in illegitimate ways. And in fact, they said, off with the veil. Burn the veil. <laughs> you know, we're free in Christ. We don't need a veil. And that was scandalous. Apparently not just to the church, but to the, the world at large. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, as we learned back in chapter 8. And in chapter 14, it seems that women were disrupting the worship services leading to confusion and chaos. And apparently, uh, Timothy, Pastor Timothy in Ephesus had the same problem. So Paul instructs women to learn in quietness and submission and silence. Now, it's my contention that Paul does this not to be the woman's enemy, but rather to be her friend. I believe Paul actually wants women to exercise their spiritual gifts for the benefit of the church without discrimination, but if they had been allowed to cause chaos and to usurp authority, there would be bitter pushback, and justifiably so. So therefore, he cautioned them. They laid down some pretty strict warnings, lest they lose it all, and it become worse than it was in the beginning. So that's the way I can reconcile these warnings with chapter 11, verse 4, that says, Verse 5, excuse me. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, in other words, she should pray or prophesy with her head covered. It seems like the woman praying and prophesying is kind of assumed that that would happen. The, the question is not whether they should. The question was how should they do it? So he's not denying them their rights, he's trying to protect and save their rights. God's plan of equality and mutuality as part of redemption in Christ has begun, but it will take a little time to work out in its fullness. I remind you of Romans chapter 16, if we had time we'd, we'd look at that, but Paul lists women who worked with him, the deacon Phoebe, the fellow worker Priscilla, 
Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Eurus's sister, etc. So Paul seems to accept women as fellow workers, co-workers, with very few questions or limitations. But because of the specific problems in these specific places, Corinth and Ephesus, he gives these precautions. So we've looked at what is unchangeable, God's principle for all time, and we've looked at Paul's specific warnings and cautions for that specific situation and place and time. Now let's try and look at what does that mean for us today? What is the church's responsibility or privilege for this time and this place? Number one, I believe that we are called to work out the full meaning of Galatians 3.28, where Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now obviously they are Jews and Greeks, they are slaves and free, they are males and female, but they are all one in Christ. In other words, the differences somehow are overcome because of our relationship to Christ, because of being part of the body of Christ. So part of that working out is allowing and enabling and even encouraging women to fully employ the spiritual gifts that God has invested in them for the building up of the body of Christ, for the goal of bringing glory to Christ, the head of the church. Now, no, women are not to usurp authority. They are not to demand. They are not to connive to gain control or shout to be heard. But neither should they be denied the privilege of serving in accordance with how God has gifted them. Because being a deacon or trustee or teacher or committee member is not ultimately a position of authority. Rather, it ultimately is a position of service. On the way up today, I was listening to Christian radio and I heard Anne Graham Watts preaching. And when she got done, I said, well, praise the Lord. That message was just as good as any of those that her father gave. Billy Graham's daughter. How can we say she should be silent and she shouldn't be heard? Every member of the body is needed. I do not believe that God draws a line and says, you know, because of your gender, you cannot serve here. Because of your gender, you cannot practice your gift. You cannot exercise a spiritual gift that God may have given you. So I say praise God that we have the privilege of demonstrating that we are new creations in Christ, reaching our full potential as Christ continues his work of transforming us into his likeness. There was a second century pagan named Labanius and he observed the church. He, he watched the church, the early church in action. And with admiration and astonishment, he exclaimed, My goodness, what women these Christians have. 
what women these Christians have. I absolutely agree. Because when I observe the church in action in 2021, I say praise God for the men that we have. And I also say praise God for the women that we have that work alongside of us for the building up of the church and for bringing glory to Christ. So let's put women in their place. As God calls them, as he blesses them with gifts and abilities to be used for the strengthening of the church and for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Let's pray. God, we have humbly looked at your word, and I confess that this is not the last word. I'm not an expert in this area, but I see clearly what you demand for all times. Some things never change. But it seems that because of Christ and his redemptive power, and because of the fact that we are new creations in Christ, some things have changed. And yes, some things must change. So God, we praise you for your church. We praise you that you have called us, that you have called us out of the world, that you have called us to serve you, that you have called us to serve your church, to serve our brothers and sisters <coughs> in Christ. And we ask that as we proceed through the next weeks and months and years of the history of this church, that you would teach us what exactly that means. That men would exercise their headship and their authority humbly, and that women would submit where that is called for, but have the courage to exercise their gifts and abilities for your glory, and that the church may be built up as each member functions and does its part. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the one and only head of his church, Jesus Christ. Amen.